Okay, just we are live at this point, Mr. Marshall. And uh, okay, I, I won't say anything. And, funny and recording, <laughs> Mr. Malloy. <laughs> okay. Good to go, Pam. I'm just double checking that we, okay, I see one person in the panelists. I see Chris Chamberlain has arrived. Um, Yep. That's, what, and that's what I see. So I do believe you are good to go. We are recording. You have a quorum, 632. Go for it. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of December 7th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 632 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and amended or extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 22 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do that, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Tom Long. Present. Uh, we know Andrew McDougall is absent this evening. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan is absent this evening also. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the hearing. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your re request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Uh, please indicate you wish to make a comment at those times by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the first item in our agenda for this evening uh, is our minutes. And I believe we have, is that right? We have two sets of minutes available for this evening? No, you only have one. Okay. You should have no so, November uh, 2nd. Yeah, the minutes of December or November 2nd are in the packet. Um, board members, any comments on the minutes uh, as drafted by Chris and Pam? Johanna. They're very detailed, um, 14 pages. It's a little longer than I would expect minutes to be, but it's fine. All right. Thanks, Johanna. Uh, Tom, you're, mu you're muted, Tom. I would move to approve the meeting minutes. All right. Thank you, Tom. Does anybody want to second that? 
Johanna. I second the motion. All right, thanks, Johanna. You just beat Karen. Uh, board members, are there any other, uh, any comments on the minutes uh, beyond the one we have already heard? Not seeing any hands. Why don't we go through a vote for the November 2nd minutes as drafted with no changes. Um, all right, well, we'll start. Bruce? I approve. All right, and Tom? Approve. And Johanna? Approve. And Karen? Approve. And I'm gonna approve as well. All right, so that was efficient and swift. Uh, all right, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, the public comment period. And at this time I see five attendees in the meeting uh, in the public. Uh, uh, Bruce Allen, Chris Chamberlain, Connor Burgess, uh, Elizabeth DeCourcy, and Rob Crowner. And I know several of those people are here for uh, items later on our agenda. All right. Um, do any members of the public want to make a comment at this time on something that's not on our agenda this evening? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, we'll move on from that item. The time now is 6.38. All right, so the third item on our agenda is a special permit public hearing. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. I wanted to introduce this topic after you read the opening. I will make a few statements. Thank you. Okay. All right. Then I will continue. All right. So this is for SPP 2023-02 <laughs> with uh, Bruce Allen on 51 Spalding Street. Request to reopen the public hearing for SPP 2023-02 to consider the proposal and make the required findings under section 10.38 rather than 11.24 of the zoning bylaw and to review the proposal in light of changes to the site plan that have occurred since the public hearing was closed on October 19th, 2022. The original request was for a special permit to modify ZBA uh, FY 2007-00030 uh, and allow three roomers within an owner-occupied dwelling unit, construct five parking spaces previously approved, and construct two parking spaces within the front setback in the northwest corner of the parcel, and relocate an existing shade tree within the front setback under sections 3.3210, 5.0100, and 7.000 of the zoning bylaw. Map 14B, parcel 110 in the RG zoning district. All right, do we have any board member disclosures? I do not see any hands. Chris, why don't you go ahead and do your introduction? Um, on October 19th, the planning board um, closed its public hearing on this case and um, approved the site plan and approved what was being proposed as far as the use of the building and made a, a list of conditions and then also made a list of findings. Um, <clears throat> we were starting to write up the decision, but the next day we were alerted by one of the neighbors, uh, Ms. DeCourcy, that um, one of the trees that had been shown on the site plan to be preserved and had actually been referenced in a condition um, was taken down. And um, so that was a surprise. And we went to the building commissioner and asked, well, how can we remedy this? And he suggested reopening the public hearing. We also discovered that um, this is, we know it's a special permit application that had been uh, put forth. And um, <clears throat> the findings that were made were under the site plan review section of the bylaw, and they should have been under the special permit section of the bylaw. So reopening the public hearing also gives us an opportunity to 
um, correct that situation and to make findings under the appropriate section of the bylaw, which is 10.38 for a special permit. So that's what this is all about. And Mr. Allen may wish to um, present his reasons for taking down the tree. He did send me an email um, after, after we received notification from Mr. Corsi, Mr. Allen sent an email uh, describing why he had taken down the tree, and you may wish to hear from him about that. And I think that's really all I have to say, other than we do have findings and conditions to go through with you tonight, should you choose to um, wrap up this public hearing and approve what's being proposed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Allen, uh, do you wish to say anything at this time? You are muted. Uh, I'd recommend you read the emails I sent to, to Christine because what happened was um, pretty much a few weeks, a number of weeks before that hearing, I had the tree warden come over because I wanted him, he told me that the little tree we had in the front was not a public shade tree. And I wanted him to come over here now that we had the um, property stakes out for him to verify that it, it was not a public shade tree because we're gonna move that. Now, I didn't know what a public shade tree was. So I, I we walked around the property and I asked him, you know, is this a public shade tree? Is this a public shade tree, the ones by the driveway? And he said, no, they're not because they're not on public property. And then we started talking about this Douglas fir tree. And I said, is it normal for this thing to have lost all of its needles? And he said, no, it's not, it's, it's in distress, but um, I, I can't tell you anything about it legally because I'm not allowed to provide comment on trees which are not quote public shade trees. I suggest you get an arborist in here, look at it. So I wrote an email to um, Re Rebecca DeCourcy because the, the tree is half on her prop their property next door. And I said that we're gonna get an arborist in here to look at it uh, but it more than likely will have to be cut down. And she said, yeah, I know it's in decline. Uh, and I asked if she would help pay to cut it down. And they said, no, but she said, we agreed it should, it probably should be cut down. Uh, the arborist came in and gave me a list of things that were wrong with it. Now, what happened was he, he gave us that information two days before the public hearing. I didn't really give it a whole lot of thought. Uh, and then when you voted on that public hearing night to upset, accept the site plan. I thought what you were doing was just approving the driveways that we were putting in because you had asked us to come back with a landscaping plan. And I thought the tree was part of the landscaping plan, which we hadn't put together yet. So that was all fine and good. And then Thursday morning after the hearing, the, uh, our arborist had called and said he was going to be working in the Amherst area on, on Thursday and whether or not you know, he would like us to come over and cut the tree down. He had told us that the, the tree was in decline, uh, also that it was safe to, for his people to climb it and cut it now, but he couldn't guarantee that after the winter it would be safe to climb and would have to bring a crane in. I mean, it was $1,000 to cut the tree down. It's not like something I wanted to do. However, now knowing that we had three arborists telling us we had a problem tree that was big enough to land on Spalding Street and hit anything that was in its way, I felt we, were we now had a liability on our hand, which we needed to deal with. Now, in hindsight, it didn't occur to me that this tree was part of a site plan, uh, and I didn't think the town would have a problem with us cutting down a potentially dangerous tree. So we went ahead and did it. I didn't know that that was any type of violation because I didn't know the tree was part of the driveway. I, I thought that was gonna be part of the landscaping plan. So I guess in hindsight, I should have at least contacted Christine or someone and asked them if it was okay to cut it down. So that's 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 my being bad. So I, I, I take full, full blame for that. Um, Hopefully that explains the situation to you. We didn't want to take the tree down, but it's been it's been getting worse every single year. And I would rather not have the tree there when we start doing this work. All right, thank so you. I was, I was concerned about the liability. Um, there was no guarantee. To, I think that I think in hindsight the tree might have made it through the winter without falling down uh, because we didn't find a whole lot of rot in it. But it was definitely in bad shape. The bark was uh, had bugs in it, 
had needle cast disease, mass disease, a few other things. So there are, uh, I, I sent uh, photographs of the tree to the board. So uh, you can take a look at all that if you'd like. All right, thank you. And am I correct that, that we have a new site plan submitted as part of our packet here that now identifies an existing tree stump as opposed to an existing tree? Yes, and I'll also note that that includes the proposed plantings that were requested to be submitted to the board um, as part of the conditions of approval. So this is the landscape plan that we talked about before. Yes, exactly. All right, and so assuming this all goes ahead, this will conclude our business on this topic with your team. As far as I know, that's everything we have to come back to you with. Okay. All right. And Mr. Allen, you now understand that when we, uh, assuming we approve this special permit, you, you need to be in contact with the town about any changes to the site, regardless of, uh, you know, whether it's a liability or not. Yes, I'm aware of that. All right, so uh, Chris, do we need to do new findings and conditions now that we're dealing with a different section of the zoning bylaw? Yes, I think you do. And you should maybe uh, also have Chris Chamberlain describe the new site plan to you with have, which has the new plantings on it, the new landscape plan, I should say. Um, and then you'd be able to approve that. That's one of the conditions of the, um, mm -hmm. the approval that you made last time. All right. Chris, do you want to go ahead and talk about that? Uh, I am happy to do that. It won't take terribly long. Um, let me see if I will be able to share. It looks like I will. Um, so this is a plan that probably looks familiar to you from some weeks ago. Um, we we're reflecting the, the same um, driveway layout that we had before. Um, we also had uh, one of our landscape designers go out and just uh, catalog the handful of plantings that already exist along the property line. So that's entirely clear. Um, those being uh, uh, crab apple and some cypress that are, are existing, um, already uh, sort of screening this portion of the driveway. Um, and then the proposal is to really concentrate the proposed plantings um, in this area right here, which is currently uh, wide open um, and where we have a couple of new parking spaces proposed. Um, as you'll see, this is the uh, existing tree that remains in this location, which is healthy. Uh, this point called out as existing stump, which is literally true now um, uh, and was at the time that we went out to look at the, the plantings to make up the existing conditions plan. Um, and there's a proposal for a mix of arborvitae and boxwood, uh, both evergreens, uh, but with, you know, a little bit of different texture to uh, provide a little bit of variation there, um, and both uh, very low maintenance uh, and hardy uh, that can be hacked away at and still grow happily um, so that we can keep the screening intact for a long time. Uh, five of those each for a total of 10 um, for for a good thick screening there toward the uh, street edge of the site, um, but all of them located behind the closest tree to the street. So there's no um, impact to existing sight lines or anything like that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, board members, have you got questions about the revised site plan or are there any other comments you wanna make regarding uh, us being back here at this at this hearing talking about uh, this particular property. All right, so we'll go ahead and um, I can't remember, Chris, is it you or was it Nate that had drafted the uh, findings and conditions? I drafted the findings. Nate drafted the conditions based on the last um, meeting. Um, you may want to hear from the public before you do the findings and conditions, just in case there would be anything that might change as a result of public comment. <clears throat> but right. then well, we can go through them. There are any members of the public that would like to make a comment at this time? 
All right, I see Rob Crowner's hand. Could we bring him over? Rob, if you'd give us your full name and your address. Um, it's Rob Crowner from 44 Spalding Street. This is actually Mungla Jagdish. I also live at 44 Spalding Street. I'm um, you not- you name your name one more time? That was Mungla Jagdish, M-A-N-G-A-L-A. J-A-G-A-D-E-E-S-H. Thank you. So I'm not understanding how we as neighbors can trust this process, given what has happened in the past and what just happened right after the site plan review. I mean, uh, right after the approval. It was clear that that tree was talked about at the hearing and was decided that, that was going to remain. If the property owners had already been in touch with an arborist and already had some plans for that tree, that could have been brought up by them at the hearing and was not. And now we are hearing that it was just inadvertent that they didn't know that this was part of it. And I'm sorry, I have a really hard time trusting that, given that that morning they had already taken their cars out of the driveway in anticipation of that tree going down. So I just have to say, I would like to understand from the planning board, how we are supposed to have any trust that any of the things that you are putting as conditions are actually gonna be followed through on, considering the years and years and years of getting approvals and having things not go through. And I understand that you, when you made this approval, you said that they would could wait until August to have this done. So now there's gonna be many, many months between this approval and when, it's, when work is even supposed to be started. And I don't know, I mean, I guess my question really is, I, you have already put a lot of time into this, way more time than I feel you, know, you should be having to do. And I don't know what I'm really asking here because you're not in a position of being able to manage this particular property, but just for this and for the future, what do you do as a board, as a policy, when you see property owners continuously not actually following what you stated in your plans? And so this is not just particularly for this property, but is there anything that you can do. And if in this case, what you're gonna do is just say, oh, it was just an honest mistake. There's no consequences to it. We are just gonna go ahead and, you know, go ahead from where we are. That's problematic to me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I do not see any other hands. Uh, Chris, I, I think, uh, I'm already forgetting the name Angela. Maybe uh, I, I'm already. I'm. I. I wondered how you'd respond to that. That concern that uh, it's hard for us to keep track of whether owners are uh, following the, the the conditions that we impose. The best thing to do is to notify the building commissioner if someone becomes aware that conditions aren't being followed. The planning board doesn't really have the time, they're volunteers and you know they have other jobs and other responsibilities. So they don't really have the time to drive around town and make sure that all of the conditions that they've put on various properties have been um, followed. But neighbors are able to contact the building commissioner and let him know when something hasn't been done properly. And I know that at times that doesn't work and I'm um, sorry for that but um, that's really the best course of action. And the building commissioner is very responsible and usually does um, get something done if there's a, if there's a complaint. <clears throat> Chris, when a property changes hands, uh, is it likely that a new owner would look and become aware of the conditions and, or, and, or a prospective owner would become aware of the conditions and see whether they were actually the facts on the ground before they purchased the property? Um, this uh, decision will be filed at the Registry of Deeds, so a new owner should be aware if his um, attorney does um, a title search 
that there is a site plan review decision, or excuse me, a special permit decision on the property and um, should know about this. And I think that one of the conditions that we put in place last time, or maybe we're putting it in place this time, is to say that a new owner needs to come back to the planning board to meet with them and talk about um, what he's proposing to do with the property. And I don't have that piece of paper right in front of me at the moment, but um, maybe either Nate or Pam can find that. Um, but we do have a condition to that effect. Okay. All right, uh, I see a couple of hands from board members. Johanna, you were next. Thank you, Doug. Um, and thanks for the public comment. Um, my thoughts were still percolating, but um, I now have, I guess, two questions. So one is, what, if any, consequences are there when an applicant doesn't follow the site plan? So, you know, what are the tools in the, um, in Rob Mora's toolbox to hold people accountable to the conditions? And then my second thought is, it just seems to me like in this case, the applicant didn't actually understand the process and that you know a landscape plan is different from a site plan and so i'm curious what educational resources or you know like how i think there's sometimes we get professional applicants who do projects all the time and they just know the process inside and out and sometimes we get lay people and so knowing a little bit more about how the process is laid out so that people are clear on the expectations would be helpful for me. And speaking to the um, the question of how can you trust the process? Well, Johanna, I, I'll elaborate or uh, pile on on that question. You know, this applicant already deviated from an earlier permit. You know, the, the renovation to the house did not follow the plan that was approved. And so, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to give them the benefit of the doubt that they just didn't understand it. Um, so Chris, why don't you go ahead and see what you, how you wanna to respond to Johanna. Well, I wanted to just say that the building commissioner does have the ability to issue enforcement orders um, and eventually take applicants, eventually fine applicants. And if they don't pay the fine, take them to court. So we try not to do that. We try to work with the applicant to get them to comply with the conditions, but um, that is an ultimate um, response if applicants don't comply. Um, in this case, it could also be a case of not um, renewing a rental registration or um, something to that effect. And the fact that the applicant didn't understand the process, I... I'm not sure that I agree with that or buy into that, but that's, I can't read somebody else's mind. So I'm sorry that the applicant says that they didn't understand the process. Maybe we need to do a better job of explaining it as staff people. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Chris. Tom. Thanks, Doug. And thank you for your public comment. And um, I tend to agree with Doug in this case that I have a really hard time giving them the benefit of the doubt, given the conditions in the past that have been violated. And, and I guess, um, aside from us being able to make judgment calls on character, which seems really problematic, here's someone that's untrustworthy. That's a characteristic that I think we can't make votes on. Um, is there a way for these things to be tallied and collect? Like, is there a two strikes rule? Like, is there a way in which we as the planning board can talk about uh, a certain accruement of violations that then have an effect on future decisions? So I, I think that's something I would really like us to have a conversation about um, in the future um, for conditions like this, where I feel like we're all in agreement, or may, many of us might be in agreement that um, this was not an accidental violation. Um, but I'd like to find a way for those to be recorded, documented, and then have some written consequence or effect on future, as you were saying, Chris, whether it's a, a rental agreement or, or some other thing in the future, 
um, so, so that we can at, at least monitor these things and, and make the proper decision in the future. And Tom, you do realize we're at a decision point where I believe we could deny the special permit. I don't know if there's a consensus about that, but uh, Nate, I see your hand. Sure, thanks. The, um, you know, one of the conditions from um, before, and it's still there, is you know, that the owner would maintain a complaint log and then the responses to that, and that's something that would be shared, uh, could be shared with the town, you know, if there's future permitting. And so, you know, I think at this point, you know, um, if there's, you know, a, a problematic or, um, you know, recurring violations, then it could be something, um, you know, to, to discuss. But at this point, you know, if there's the complaints that have been previous about this property, say parking and other things are being addressed by this permit. And so it's staff's opinion that, you know, with this revised site plan, whether or not, you know, independent of the tree cutting that getting parking on the property was addressing some of the problems that were, um, you know, discussed in the neighborhood. And so, you know, this would be, you know, the solution. And so moving forward, it would be, you know, are there continuous complaints about some of the things that are being addressed right now, right? So if this were approved and then, you know, the parking plan wasn't followed or, you know, certain things happen, then that becomes, as Chris mentioned, a, an enforcement possibility or a response from the town. But, you know, we see the, you know, this going through this permitting is, you know, the action that can remedy the previous complaints. Um, and so, you know, we think that's, you know, that's, you know, a good step. Um, Nate or Chris, uh, given that we've allowed the implementation of the plan to drag out to August, um, would it make sense for us to put a uh, to put our first agenda item on the first meeting in in August to uh, have these folks check in with us and 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 see that they have in fact complied with the site plan? And uh, is, it, is, it, is it allowed for us to reopen a hearing at that, that, that far into the future or, or you know, that, with that much time between now and then? I guess that was a question for you, Chris. So once the public hearing is closed and a decision has been written and filed at the Registry of Deeds, there is not any longer an opportunity to open the public hearing. Okay. We would have to take some other course of action. Okay, thank you. Bruce, I see your hand. Sorry, it took me a while to unmute. I think we should just ask Chris uh, or Rob to uh, do that, Doug. I think it's a good idea. I think we should put these folks on notice that uh, we're paying attention because clearly they need uh, a little more uh, supervision than anyone else that I've uh, come across in the now eight years that I've served on the planning boards over the past 25. So they're a special case. Um, uh, I would simply uh, say you as chair uh, formally asked Chris and Rob to uh, report to us on uh, an, on a meeting in August as to the whether this uh, project has been wrapped up successfully and then we can just take a staff report at the end of the meeting. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Chris or uh, Bruce. Okay, uh, I see, let's see, Bruce, I assume you're done with your hand. Uh, Johanna, I see your hand again. I do see one public hand also. Um, if we, I'm just trying to figure out the path forward. So if we approve this revised plan, they, whenever can they can do the construction, they move forward and at, Rob Mora is involved and make sure it gets met. If we reject it, what happens? They have to come up with a whole new proposal and restart the process. Uh, Chris? I think if you reject it, that's um, not a good, not a good motion to make because Rob put this path in place to correct the problems that had occurred previously. So if you reject this um, proposal, then we're kind of back to the situation where they were non-compliant with the 2007 um, special permit. And then, you know, Rob will have to somehow deal with that in another way that is probably not as, um, not as collegial or friendly as this way. 
And so by approving this special permit, you give Rob the ability to enforce this special permit along with the site plan, along with the new parking. And um, it has a better chance of a good outcome than not, ex not um, approving it. That's my opinion. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Johanna, you're all set? Okay. All right, I don't see any more hands uh, among the board. Uh, why don't we bring Elizabeth DeCourcy over and let her speak. Elizabeth, give us your, I guess you've already given us your uh, address and name. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the board members for going through this very long and tedious process. Um, I would just like to say, although Bruce and Carol did speak to us about cutting down the tree that is slightly on our property, I was surprised at the last board meeting, they did not mention it when it was brought up. Um, and this goes back to trust issues that I have and I feel now my other neighbors also have with believing what they say. They did ask us about the tree. I was very surprised when not only it was brought up, but the other, the dogwood tree and relocating it for the street, for the parking on the other side, why they didn't bring it up then. It would have been a very simple matter to do, and I find it very hard. And I know I'm reiterating what Mangala said. They moved their cars. They had a company there at 8.30 in the morning for that tree to come down. I have a very hard time to believe it just happened that morning. I don't know too many tree companies that would show up with five minutes notice or give 10 minutes or a half hour notice that they were coming which it seems like Bruce is saying what happened. Um, I There is just such a huge trust issue. I have been fighting this fight and finally let Rebecca fight it for me um, for years with the town. Um, and I would just ask you to think about, I'm sorry, the absolute lack of trust I have with these neighbors now and how they will flaunt anything you do and to please put some type of enforcement in place so they can't keep on doing this. Again, I thank you all very much for your time and I'm sorry I got emotional. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I think the next hand I'm gonna recognize is Amy Gates, also of the public. Let's bring Amy over and she can give us her name and her address. Hi, Amy Gates, I'm at 54 Spalding Street. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if this was already covered, but I just got home from work and my big issue at this point, I guess it again falls under the trust category is how are we gonna make sure that whatever plan is approved is actually gonna be followed through on and maintained, not just with um, the parking spaces and how they design it and all that, but with, with the residents that are inside. All right, thanks, Amy. I think I can say that uh, we've been talking about how to make sure that happens. And uh, at the moment, we're thinking we will bring this topic back to a future meeting and uh, probably midsummer and uh, have a staff member report back on the progress toward compliance with the plan that was approved. All right, Mr. Allen, I see your hand. You may wanna to respond to some of those comments. Yes, I wanna respond. That tree was full of bugs. We didn't realize how bad it was until we got out there looking to do the planning for the, the um, landscaping. And regard, you know, we will work with the town, we'll work with Rob Moore, we'll make sure that we comply with what you want. Um, but that tree had to come down. And 
we did think it was part of the what we were coming back for the landscaping. We thought it was a necessary to take care of, but all right. So anyway, you don't have to worry. We will make sure. And you know, we're very clear with what you're saying. We're very clear with the fact that you want to make sure we're in compliance and we get it. Okay. And we realize that there's going to be a follow-up. So you don't have to worry. There's going to be a follow-up and that's it. I mean, the tree it did have to come down though. And we did not know well in advance. We are not arborists. We got to see that it had a lot of holes in it. It was full of these worms and that tree wasn't gonna last. I, I just wanna also point yeah. out is we did this because we now had a financial liability with that tree. It might've made it through the winter or it might have fallen on Amy Gates's house. That's how bad it would have been. It would have definitely crossed Spalding Street. Hopefully it wouldn't have crushed any cars or anybody walking down. We had a liability, okay? We didn't know, I honestly didn't know I was supposed to tell the town that we had to cut down a dangerous tree. I was under the impression that the town would want people to cut down dangerous trees. So in hindsight, I guess I should have called Christine and asked her if this was okay. But, you know, I... I kind of panicked. I hate to say this, but you know, I don't like liabilities like trees. I've had too many trees fall on things in my life. So, and people gotten hurt. Uh, it, it, it frightens me. So anyways, uh, that's it. I've said my say. Yeah. And the tree did look sickly, but we didn't know how bad it was until we, you know, we were actually out there now for the, for the landscaping plan, really looking close at this stuff and trying to figure out what plantings would be appropriate and everything. And that brought our attention directly on it. And right. trust me, I don't feel I'm like sorry that, about that. I, I don't feel like spending a thousand dollars just to thwart a site plan. Okay. I, I, I <laughs> nobody who wants to spend a thousand dollars for something that's not necessary. That's all I'm trying to say. So don't take it the wrong way. I'm, we're not trying to thwart the plan. We're trying to do what's yeah. best for us and our neighbors and our town. That's and keep it. everybody safe. And keep everybody safe. That's it. I mean, so this has gotten completely blown out of proportion. Okay. All right. Thank you for those comments. All right, board members, does anybody want to make, I guess we ought to go through the findings and conditions. And Chris, do you think this is the appropriate time to do that? Yes. Do you want me to read them? Yeah, I guess you, you should. We received them in your email this afternoon, but Pam yeah. can bring them up on the um, screen here. And we'll try the findings first. The findings, as I said before, relate to... Um, special permit for use. So this is a little different from the kinds of special permits that the planning board normally sees. Normally you see special permit, um, special permits for dimensional um, requirements. So Pam, I think it's on the second, uh, third page. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah the okay. board found. Yes, the board found under section 10.38 of the zoning bylaw as follows. The proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed and or the total town as deemed appropriate by the special permit granting authority. The proposal is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted by right in the same district. There are two, there are other two family houses in the neighborhood and there are multifamily dwellings at both ends of the street. So do you agree with that statement? <clears throat> I don't see any hands. I think Chris, we ought to um, proceed to, uh, unless I see hands objecting. Okay, that's fine with me. Uh, why don't, you know, after each one, why don't you pause briefly just so I can take a look at the screen and then uh, keep going. Okay, so... Um, and by the way, if you want some help reading, let us know at what point you're ready for someone else to take over. All okay. right. Finding 10.382, the proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. As a two-family house with rooms leased to boarders, the proposal is not expected to contribute to water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. 10.38, oh, pause. Okay. I don't, no hands. 10.383. The proposal would not be a substantial inconvenience or hazard to abutters 
vehicles or pedestrians. The proposal will contain, contain all proposed or required parking spaces on site with the type of entrance and exit um, vehicular movement from the driveway and two parking spaces along the frontage that is similar to that of other driveways along the street. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. 10.385, the proposal reasonably protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive uses on the site, including air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. There will be plantings along the southern border of the property to shield adjacent properties to the south from headlights and the view of cars. Exterior lighting on the, on the building will be fixed with shields and downcast to keep light from shining onto adjacent properties. Hey, Pam, do you think you could blow this up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Maybe make it. Whoop. That's too big. That's a little far. There, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. Oh, all right. All right. 10.386, the proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations, Article 7 and 8, respectively, of the zoning bylaw. Six parking spaces will be provided two for the main dwelling unit, one for the accessory dwelling unit, and one for each of the rooms to be let to borders in accordance with section 7.0000 of the zoning bylaw. All right, Chris, I see Bruce's hand. I think there's a typo in there. Shouldn't it be five parking spaces will be provided? Uh, oh, hold on. They're be providing uh, six. No, sorry, I, I, I was getting confused. I was thinking that you were talking about six where there were five and another two, but you are you are tallying them differently. I apologize. Okay. Okay. 10.387, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjacent streets, property, or improvements. A traffic impact report will not be required. Entrance and exit to the to and from the parking spaces is similar to that from other properties along the street and is typical of single and two family homes in Amherst. 10.388, the proposal ensures adequate space for the off street loading and unloading of vehicles, goods, products, materials, and equipment incidental to the normal operation of the establishment or use. Provision of loading and unloading of vehicles would be typical of that of other single and two family houses in the neighborhood. <clears throat> 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or storage for sewage, refuse, recyclables, and other waste resulting from the uses permitted or permissible on the site and methods of drainage and surface water. The town engineer has reviewed the proposal and has not expressed concerns about these issues. A management plan discusses appropriate disposal of refuse and recyclables. The Conservation Commission has reviewed the proposed storm water drainage from the property and has not expressed concern about the site plan. 10.390 is not applicable. The property is not located in the flood prone conservancy zoning district. 10.391 is not applicable. There are no unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features on the site. And the Conservation Commission has reviewed the proposal for any possible impacts on the wetlands at the rear of the property and has found the proposal to be satisfactory. 10.392, the proposal provides adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses, provision of street trees, landscape islands in the parking lot, and a landscape buffer along the street frontage. The proposal includes new plantings along the southern property line and includes moving a tree in the front yard that will help to screen the two parking spaces along the frontage. 10.393, the proposal provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting. The exterior lights will be shielded and or downcast. 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. There are no steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, or significant grade changes on the site. There are wetlands at the rear of the property 
The proposal has been reviewed by the Conservation Commission and has, found to be satis has been found to be satisfactory. 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use, scale, and architecture of ex existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functional or visual relationship thereto. There are no changes proposed to the building and only minor changes proposed to the site. The property is in the RG zoning district and is not located within the boundaries of a national register district. That's in response to the suggestion that this be taken to the design review board or that the design review standards and conditions be used in evaluating this. So we're saying it's not really required because of the district that it's in. Um, 10.396, the proposal provides screening for storage areas, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, utility buildings, and similar features. Storage areas are located at the rear of the building and are thus screened by the building. 10.397, the proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open space, and amenities for the proposed use. There's a large open yard at the rear of the building which can be used for recreation. There is also a deck on the back of the building. 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw and the goals of the master plan. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Okay. <clears throat> so we can go on to the conditions if you're ready for that. Yeah, how's your voice? I think it'll hold out All right. for a while anyway. All right. Um, so I think there was a blank page in there. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so these conditions were conditions that you saw on October 19th, and then Nate made changes to them based on your discussion on October 19th, but it's worth um, reviewing them anyway. Um, so number one is the property shall contain no more than two existing units and provide rooms for up to three roomers. Number two, the property shall provide a template lease for the second dwelling unit and for each rooming unit to the building commissioner. Is that is that on an annual basis or once? I think once. Because there, you had a discussion about that previously and we talk, talked about the fact that the building commissioner doesn't really want to receive four leases every year for this yeah. property because he's got a lot of other things that are going on. So once is enough. And In that's the, prior to issuing a <clears throat> building per, a permit or? at the well, conclusion of, uh, you know, before a certificate of occupancy or when, when does that happen? Why don't we say prior to the construction of the driveway? Okay. Would that be okay? Sure. So I better make a note of that. Let's see. And that's number two. Um, I'm seeing Bruce's hand. Go ahead, Mr. Allen. Yes, uh, we gave those to Rob Morrow about six months ago. He has those template leases. He has the leases. It's all, it's all there. Yep. He's got it. He's had them for about six months. We've done that. Confirm that. I will confirm that. Great. Okay. Um, bed uh, Number three, bedroom six, as shown on the plans dated June 28th, 2022, prepared by Fitch Architecture and Community Design and reviewed by the planning board on September 7th and October 19th, shall be maintained as an accessory rooming unit under section 5.0100 of the zoning bylaw, and shall not contain a separate cooking facility that establishes a full kitchen as defined by applicable state law. Bedroom six is on the ground floor adjacent to the efficiency unit that has its own entry exit, egress, excuse me. Number four, the property shall register with the residential rental program and shall be subject to periodic inspection as required by the zoning and by the code enforcement officer. Number five, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shielded. Number six, applicants shall submit a final landscape plan, including plantings along the southern property line for a review and approval by the planning board. Well, he's just done that. So we could really strike yeah, it Number looks like 60. we could go back to the previous text, which said planting shall be installed and maintained in accordance with the approved plan. Okay. All right. Um, 
Okay. Um, number seven, a parking management plan shall be provided to each roomer and tenant. Number eight, parking spaces shall be assigned to specific roomers and tenants. Number nine, there shall be a total maximum of six cars allowed for all occupants. Number 10, the occupants of the efficiency unit shall be permitted to have a maximum of one car. This restriction shall be a condition of the lease. Number 11, all parking shall, shall occur on improved asphalt surfaces only. Number 12, parking for occupants, tenants shall occur off street in defined spaces only and is prohibited along the apron of the driveway. Number 13, hey, Chris, so we, yep. I'm sorry, I'm sort of mulling over number 10. And um, well, don't we really mean the occupants of the efficiency unit shall be permitted to park only one car on the property? To park only one car on the property. Yes. I mean, they can have more cars. They can have more cars. <laughs> they just can't park them here. So, yeah. Thank you. Tom. I'm not as facile as Nate in making <laughs> real time changes to these things. So, I'm writing it all down. <laughs> I so agree, Chris. We, we also want to make sure that that, that if there is an additional car that is not being parked on the street, but I would notice that we we mentioned that earlier, didn't we? That all cars need to be parked in the parking lot, right? Yeah. You okay. can see that. <clears throat> I think that's number 12, isn't it? Parking for occupants, tenants shall occur off street in defined spaces only and is prohibited along the apron of the driveway. I suppose if they had a party, they could park in the street while they had the party, but then they would have to go home, the people who came to the party. Um, number 13, snow removal shall be done to ensure snow storage does not encroach the 25-foot wetland buff buffer areas. I think that was more of an issue when the parking extended further into the backyard, but it's still good to have that condition there. Mm -hmm. Number 14, an as-built drawing certified by a registered land surveyor shall be provided to the building commissioner upon installation of the parking areas and plantings to demonstrate compliance with the approved plans. Number 15, any alterations to the approved site plans or building plans shall be submitted to the building commissioner who will determine if the changes are substantial enough to require submission to the planning board for review and approval. Number 16. The approved management plans, parking plan, and complaint response plan shall remain in effect at all times. Number 17, this is the one that Nate was talking about before. The owner shall maintain a log of complaints filed with the owner, manager, or town of Amherst and document actions taken by the owner in response to the complaint. This information shall be made available to the code enforcement officer upon request. Number 18. The special, this special permit shall be filed with the registry of deeds prior to any work proceeding. So that's how a new um, property owner knows that there's a special permit on this property. Number 19, all work associated with the approved plans and conditions of this permit shall be completed by August 30th of 2023, unless extended by the building commissioner for good cause. So when you said before that you wanted Nate or me to report to you um, sometime in the summer. Do you want to make that time after August 30th, say the first meeting in September that you would receive this report? Yeah, I think that seems, you know, like a reasonable sequence. Okay, I'll make a note of that. I mean, it could be just as short as you know, the owners have complied with all the conditions of the permit. Yeah, right. I just want to get the date right. If we're yeah. giving them until August 30th to do the work, it makes sense to report after that. Okay, um, number 20, upon change of ownership, the new owner shall appear at a public meeting of the planning board to review an updated management plan, parking plans, and complaint response plan. Number 21, a certified arborist shall monitor construction 
for the safety, protection, and health of existing trees. Okay. All right. Thank you for reading all those, Chris. And I noticed uh, on the document in between the findings and conditions, we had the, the one waiver draft to, of 7.90. This is the blank page. Mm. There, there it is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, and so, let's see. Bruce, I see your hand. Oh, Doug, it's simply to move uh, acceptance or approval, whichever is the appropriate word of the uh, of the revised uh, or the substituted conditions. Uh, a wave of findings, uh, revised conditions, and uh, landscape plan in respect of the fifth applic uh, application, okay. da da da, 51 Spalding. Right. Um, Chris, is that an adequate motion? Do we? I think you need to approve everything that was um, requested. So if we could go back to the agenda and yep. um, read through what the agenda says, the first item on the agenda. I mean, to read that? And, yes. and Doug, we, I guess I should also preface that with the re, uh, move to close the public hearing. Uh-huh, okay. So uh, the agenda reads, request to reopen the public hearing to consider the proposal and make the required findings under section 10.38 rather than 11.24 of the zoning bylaw to review the proposal in light of changes to the site plan that have occurred since the hearing was closed. The original request was for a special permit to modify ZBA FY 2007-0030, allow three roomers within an occupied, an owner occupied dwelling unit construct five parking spaces previously approved and construct two parking spaces within the front setback. I know we've changed those numbers. Um, and relocate an existing shade tree within the front setback under sections 3.3210, 5.0100 and 7.000 of the zoning bylaw. So I just wanted to capture that last um, thing that starts with the original request. So if you would just include that in your motion because that covers everything. All right, and, and, and do you agree that we are no longer constructing five parking spaces previously approved? That's correct. It's four parking spaces of the previously approved spaces and two more within the front setback. Right. All right, so uh, if I were to, let's say, paraphrase and maybe clarify Bruce's motion, um, we would be moving to close the public hearing, accepting, approving the findings and conditions as drafted and edited during our discussion tonight. Um, Modifying ZBA FY 2007-30 and allowing three roomers within an owner-occupied dwelling, constructing four parking spaces previously approved and two within the front setback, approving relocating an existing shade tree uh, within the front setback under the sections listed. And I see Nate's hand, so I'm, I'm sure there's something wrong with that. No, I was just gonna add that um, originally there was also a waiver um, for you know a 7.9 waiver to waive section 7.0002 of the bylaw to allow up to three designated parking spaces within the front setback. So, so that should be included. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I wondered about that. Well, if that's uh, what we might term a friendly amendment, that's fine. Sure, let's call it friendly. 
All Thanks. right, so we have a motion on the floor from Bruce that's been friendly amended. Uh, Tom, I see your hand. You you here for a second? Uh, one second. All right, thank you. All right, uh, any other board members? Any comments? Any uh, final comments from the public? I know this has been an arduous process for you guys, and um, we all hope this works out well from this point on. I see a hand from Rebecca Cornell. Wonder if she could be brought over. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please give us your address, Rebecca. Hi, my name is Rebecca Cornell. Um, I'm here for 60 Spalding Street, my aunt Elizabeth DeCourcy. Um, I just want you to really consider if this uh, meets the purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw and this neighborhood. Um, I ask you not to approve all of the parking. I think, uh, you know, long term, this is really going to turn into a tenement house. Um, and then the other thing that I'm really concerned about is the enforcement. It took 15 years to get this far because I couldn't get the town on it to act on this. So what happens if our neighbor starts renting out all the bedrooms in her house and we complain about the parking and nothing happens? We're in the same boat. And I don't think this is the only circumstance around town that has this problem. So. I ask you to consider that, um, and I do have one question. Over the last week, there's no more tenants parking on the street, and I'm curious if that's something that's been um, something that the code enforcement team has enforced, or if that's just temporary and there will be additional, the tenants parking on the street again over the winter, which presents a conflict with my aunt parking at the end of her handicap ramp and using it. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Chris, are you aware of any enforcement uh, at this property in the last week or so? I'm not. Or Nate? No, okay. Um, Mr. Allen, do you have any uh, awareness of any tenants parking on the street? No, uh, currently or, or we only have- not? Currently we, we have a few tenants that don't have cars. And a lot of times we don't have tenants with cars. So anyway, the point is that no, the answer is no, we've had no problems. Yeah. All right, well, uh, you just received a complaint, so maybe it's time to start your log. All okay. right. Um, well, we-, we I, I don't understand. Well, we don't understand, is. we didn't know. A complaint about what? We have four, four cars in this house. A complaint about parking on the street, no? No one's parking on the street from our house. Okay. Oh. Only the other renters on the street are parking on the house from the other rentals across the street. All right. Yeah, that's who's been parking on yeah, the street. Yeah, other, other renters are parking on yeah, the street. Not, not, from our, house. not, not from our not house. Not from though. our house. Okay. Definitely not from our house. All right. Chris? I think that the comment was that the person was asking, why aren't there people parking on the street? What's happened? is there an enforcement? She's She wasn't really complaining. She was more noticing that there wasn't parking on the street. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for being confused. All right. Um, I see Amy Gates's hand. Why don't we bring her over? Yes, hi. I just... There's been so, this has been so long, as you said, and so much back and forth. I just want total clarification. They're, they're allowed to have three roomers, one person in the, the accessory unit, and then themselves. Is that correct? And if so, that adds up to six spaces. So I understand that. Um, I'm just wondering about, again, it's just, it's just the enforcement of it. And <clears throat> how, how, how is this being categorized? A single family with an accessory unit? This is a two family unit, I believe. And the um, and the total an, amount of people that are allowed to be an, residing. There's, a, there's one unit is an efficiency unit that can have, I believe, two people with one car. And the other unit has the occupants and three boarders. Did that answer your question, Amy? Yes, thank you, it did. And I guess my last question is, I, I, I'm 
deeply concerned about the amount of parking spaces because it's it's not in keeping with any other house on the street except at the very entrance where it's all student housing and it turning into like what Rebecca said that you know if, once they leave it'll turn or they stop staying there it'll become this big tenement renter situation with a big parking lot and so I'd like to know if is is there a situation where it's going to be deemed for owner occupied even after they leave uh, Chris I believe the owner occupancy is a condition of the permit right Owner occupancy is a condition of them being able to have rumors and borders. You did not put that as one of your conditions, but you could if you would like to do that. Yeah, I thought we talked about that back in October. <clears throat> this uh, is a huge deal for again. us on this street for that this be owner occupied. Otherwise, this is going to turn into, you know, just a party house eventually. I mean, you know, just a bunch of students and no, no supervision. I think owner occupied is essential here. Didn't, didn't we have conversation with Rob about that? We did, and Rob said that because um, the rumors and borders cannot be there unless the house is owner-occupied, yeah. then- um, We didn't need to say it. We didn't need to say it, but you can say it if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a requirement. Rooming, rumors and borders are an accessory use to an owner-occupied unit. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a requirement in the bylaw in, in section five. So it's- you know, otherwise they couldn't apply for rumors and borders. So, um, but say the property changes hands and the next owner, instead of having two owners and three borders, wants to put five, well, I guess they could only put four unrelated people into the building. Um, I know from personal experience that we often get more than four unrelated people in a rental unit. So maybe there's five, but they can only have four cars. Uh, or maybe they that group could have five. Um, so you know, maybe we should we should include the owner occupancy as as a condition. What I described, Nate, do you agree that could happen? Well, the you you know the condition is that they can only have up to three rumors. And so if they were to try to have more rumors or lodgers, that would require another permit. And so they couldn't do that. So, you know, regardless of how many owners live on the property, they have the other unit, the efficiency, which could have one or two occupants and then only three rumors or borders. And so th that can't change. And one of the units have to be, has to be owner occupied. So I don't. So you don't think it's necessary? Not, not I, really. I mean, the, uh, any new owner has to come back to kind of, check in anyway right i mean we had a condition there that any new owner has to come back and submit new plans new management plan and there were a couple other plans in there mm -hmm. yeah upon change of ownership the new ownership will appear at a public meeting to review you know and they have to complete a new management plan a parking plan a complaint response plan so uh that would be you know this would be filed at the registry and then this is you know becomes part of the property record. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are where we are. Um, I see that Rebecca Cornell has her hand up. Uh, I think that's a new hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess what I'm Following back on my earlier question, I guess what I'm asking the planning board to consider is that there's no on-street parking for tenants. Um, can we write that into the permit so we have no conflict with the ramp? Um, what I was trying to say earlier is this is the first week in 15 years there have been no tenants parked on the street, and it's nice. My aunt can use her ramp without a problem, and when there's snow, it's more of a problem. So, um, And as you know, it's hard to communicate with our neighbors about effectively their their responsibilities as landlords. So um, if you could just get the parking off the street, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Pam, I'm wondering if you could bring back up the conditions and we just look at the parking conditions one more time. And Chris, I know I had you, I had asked for an edit of, I think it was, uh, Yes, for an edit of number 10. Yeah. 
the mm -hmm. occupants of the efficiency unit shall be permitted to park only one car on the property. Right. But we do say all parking shall occur on improved asphalt surfaces and all parking for occupants and tenants shall occur off street in defined spaces only. And it's prohibited along the apron. So it seems like that. we've we've pretty well called for all the parking to have happen off the street. Karen? Is there not a possibility when you have a handicapped ramp to uh, ask that that particular area on the street is a no parking uh, thing that you can alleviate this sort of problem, which I see it's, it's a great problem. You need to have that free. It just seems to me that would make it really simple because that is the, you know, people have guests and they sometimes park on the street. It's very hard to monitor that. Uh, people that live in this house um, can have two or three people arrive and go one time and there's nothing wrong with their parking on the street sometimes. But that particular parking area seems to be sacrosanct and there must be some way. And if neighbors are friendly and help each other, it seems like this is a condition that could be easily uh, rectified. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh, Chris, does the town have a process for designation, designating a portion of a street for handicapped pickup and drop off? Yes, but usually it's a more formal place downtown. It's not usually an outlying street like this. So. I think it would have to be done through the Department of Public Works, and you'd have to get permission from the um, town council to, or at least from the town manager, to block off a certain part of the road to um, say that it couldn't be used for a normal parking. Right. Um, so that's that. So that is a separate process that probably wouldn't involve us. <laughs> That's right. All right, uh, Mr. Allen, I see your hand and I then see Amy Gates' hand again. So I would like to comment on this handicap ramp at 60 Spalding Street. It is across the street from our house. We have never had ourselves or our tenants or our guests park on that side of the street. There has never been any hindrance for Elizabeth DeCourcy to access her handicap ramp. This has been false and misleading statements ever since the beginning of these complaints have started. In fact, our two parking spaces that we're going to have in the front will preclude people from parking over there. So what I'm saying is we have never been guilty of parking on that side of the street. No one at this household has ever parked over there. And we have never impacted the uh, handicap ramp over there, which is very rarely used, by the way. All right. So thank you. Uh, but I, I hope we don't get into he said, she said with this. And because uh, we know there's been a disagreement of, of opinion about that. Mrs. Ms. Gates, uh, why don't we bring you in? Uh, Pam, you can yeah. uh, stop the screen share. Thank you. Ms. Gates? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm sorry to circle back to this, but I, I either I'm obtuse or I didn't really quite understand the answer to my question. My most important question is, are you telling us that it's implied or understood that this property will permanently be required to be owner occupied no matter who is residing there. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Unless so they come back to the board and somebody changes the findings and conditions and we have another hearing. Chris. I wanted to say that if someone occupied this house with a family and didn't have three roomers or boarders, then um, I'm not sure this needs to be owner occupied. Does it need to be a two family house in an RG district? Right, so yeah, Amy, I don't know if I responded or Chris said, uh, she asked this question previously today and it was responded. So to maintain the what's permitted now, a two family with borders or rumors, it has to be owner occupied. But if in the future they don't wanna have rumors or borders, then you know it doesn't necessarily need to be owner occupied. So it's only if they wanna continue having the same 
uh, use that it has now. And so, you know, we can't say that, you know, the house sells that it has to be owner occupied. You know, if they're not going to have rumors or borders, then it doesn't need to be. So, you know, to maintain what, what's being permitted, it does. But it depends on really what the future use is. So Nate, the, the, the larger unit with the five bedrooms, can that be a rental unit? It could, typically we don't, um, you know, as, you know, prescribe one unit or the other being owner occupied. So we could have a rental unit with nominally four unrelated adults and an efficiency unit with another two people and no owners on the property. An owner. You mind if I butt in? I think you'd need another special permit for it non-owner occupied two family in the RG zoning district. Okay. So this current special permit wouldn't cover that situation. Okay. All right, good. So we I think we've got this nailed down. All right, any further comments from the board? I don't see any hands uh, from the public. All right. Um, uh, Chris, do you have enough to write up the motion? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yep. All right. So let's make the a yes uh, to this motion is approving uh, the long list of things that have been, are before us. A no vote is rejecting those proposals. We'll go through the board and with the roll call. Bruce Colden. Yes. Tom Long. Yes. Uh, Johanna. Yes. Karen. Yes. And I'm a yes. So that's five in favor, two members absent. All right. Um, Mr. Allen, thank you. Mr. Chamberlain, thank you. Uh, the time is now 7.54, and I believe we're finished with this third item on our agenda. Uh, this hearing is closed, and we usually take a break around 8 o'clock, so this seems like an opportune time to take a break. I am showing the time at 7.54. Why don't we come, up, come all back at 8 o'clock? Thank you. Thanks. We'll, we'll see you in September. That was ridiculous. No. Karen, you are not, you were not muted. Yep, you should go on mute. She is now.
All right, I'm seeing the time is eight o'clock. If you're lurking behind the blank screen and you can let us know you're back, that would be helpful. I think the three people who are out in attendee land could be brought in for the next um, case, if Pam would do that. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I'm seeing all the board members back. Actually, Bruce is not back, so hold on. Uh, yes, I am, I'm back, uh, Doug. I okay, just you are, think. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so do you think we need to wait for Nate, or should we go? Should I go ahead and read the introduction and uh, get started, Chris? Just go ahead and read the introduction, and Nate may or may not join us because okay. he's having a family celebration tonight. Right, right, okay. All right, so, all right, so welcome back everyone. Um, the time I now have is 8.02, and we will move on to item four in our agenda for this evening. This is a site plan review public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, 
This joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding site plan review 2023-02 with by ServiceNet Inc at 12 and 22 Belchertown Road. Um, public hearing to request site plan approval to renovate the existing building and provide 12 efficiency apartment units for transitional housing with office space for associated staff. Site improvements include resurfacing and striping of existing parking, 39 spaces, including two handicapped accessible spaces, as well as demolition of one building entrance and the installation of new pedestrian access walkways and new doors and windows in the building located on map 15C in parcel 2-19 in the commercial zoning district. All right, so do we have any board member disclosure for this topic? I am not seeing any. All right. Um, Chris, do you have anything you want to say as an introduction, or should we let the applicant go right ahead? The only thing I'd like to say as an introduction is that this is um, one of those projects that is um, exempt from some of the zoning regulations under Section 3 of Chapter 40A. In other words, it's a nonprofit um, use that um, is considered to be you know, allowed by the state, we can we can allow it with certain requirements, such as um, you know limitations on size and um, height, bulk, landscaping, that type of thing. But there there's a limited number of things that you can do to um, to limit to restrict this project. So okay. I think you've heard about that previously. Um, would this be the the chapter that's colloquially known as the Dover Amendment? That's correct, yes, exactly. Yeah. So Tom Miranda might be the person to make the introduction. I think he's their attorney. Okay. Good All evening, right. uh, good evening. Thank you. And uh, actually, uh, Ryan Nelson, our engineer is gonna make the presentation for us. And I will defer to him at this point. There are some items that I may comment on during the course of the hearing but I'll leave it to Ryan. Sure, thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. For the record, Ryan Nelson from R. Levesque Associates. Um, and is it an option tonight to be able to share my screen with the site plan? Should be available to you, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, all I'm seeing is an option to raise my hand. So at the bottom of the screen, you don't have a, I just promoted him a, to a green panelist. button that says share screen. Okay, promoted to panelist. Here we go. Thank you. Great. All right. Can everyone see that? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so here in the lower right is our uh, overall site plan. I'll just zoom in on that and give a brief overview here. Uh, so this is unit one or building one. Um, of a, a, a property that has a master deed with different allocations that's broken into three, three areas. So in terms of this project, we're dealing with what's called unit one. Uh, I believe this was a vacant restaurant was the former use. Uh, I uh, believe there was an aerobics and fitness studio. Okay. Until probably uh, very recently, right? Yeah, you, you guys would know best in town. Um, probably correct. Um, so as stated, uh, they would like to retrofit or renovate this building to provide for transitional housing, uh, be 12 dwelling units with some office space in the center. So right now there's a, a, an entry porchway here. There's a parking lot located to the south. And then there's also additional parking located he over here. And that's all part of the unit one uh, common area for parking. So that's all designated for this building here. There is a stream located uh, towards the eastern property boundary. 
A lot of this work is within the buffer zone to that stream. We have submitted with Conservation Commission a notice of intent. We've already had one meeting with them. Uh, we've made quite a few revisions. So that's pending uh, review. I believe the next meeting is next week. As part of this project, this existing paved parking lot area is to be milled and repaved. It's approximately 16,571 square feet. There's two existing handicapped parking spaces. We'll be retaining those and also providing two more located here for a total of four handicapped parking spaces. Currently, there's no handicap accessibility to this building. So as part of this project, we're gonna be providing uh, a ramp, uh, accessible ramp from this um, feathered curb cut from these handicapped parking spaces it would come up this ramp to the porch and then it would also be able to access some of these units here on the left should the need arise. Um, <clears throat> additionally, the, the building currently has an entrance, entrance here and then an entrance here. Uh, this entrance farther to the east will be demoed, um, no longer needed, and instead there would be individual access doors constructed for each of these dwelling units. Um, so you have a total of seven on this right wing of the main entrance. So to access those, they'd be reconstructing the existing sidewalk here, uh, bringing that up to code and then providing an individual walkway and staircase set uh, to each dwelling unit there. Um, as part of this project, we've defined uh, the Parking striping, more clearly, currently um, there's old degraded striping and a lot of the area isn't defined. So under this proposal, there would be um, 39 formal parking spaces uh, based on the use of the site. We've calculated that 28 parking spaces would be required. And right now 42 exist. So right now there's an existing 42 parking spaces under proposed conditions, there'd be 39. And uh, that's a result of us formalizing the spaces to be to the proper size and also providing for snow storage locations and better turning radiuses at some of the corners. Um, we had submitted some preliminary architectural elevations for the, the uh, building where the entrances would be. And then, um, <clears throat> Uh, there was also an, some comments we received from the town in the um, report that was generated. Uh, I tried responding to some of those the best we could with information we have at the time. Obviously, there's other questions that we'll try and provide that information in the near future, um, but happy to answer any questions the uh, board might have. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So uh, was there a site plan uh, or a site visit that uh, we would have a report from any members who are present? Uh, Bruce. Um, well, uh, yes, we did have a site visit and uh, uh, Andrew was there, but he's not here tonight, but uh, Karen and, and uh, and Tom and I were there, so either right. one of the three of us, I think, but Chris took notes and, and she uh, distributed them. So uh, I, assuming that folks have read those notes, um, I think uh, that, uh, that, that that would be the bulk of the site report. But the reason I put my hand up was, uh, I think we were uh, unanimous in our, including Andrew, in our, um, and our feeling that uh, that the the applicant uh, may not we at the time we thought may not need all these uh, parking area parking spaces and uh, we uh, were thinking that it would be less expensive if uh, the repaving didn't include the whole of the, the site if that was necessary if that was not necessary and so I have some questions uh, when the time comes uh, related to that but. Uh, the, uh, the 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 dominant uh, uh, mood or, or, or takeaway from those of us I think that visited was uh, do we need so much paving and 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 should we and can we encourage the applicant to uh, uh, perhaps save money and, and improve the uh, the quality of the landscape by uh, 
by digging up and, and seeding some of these uh, current parking areas. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, Tom, I see your hand. And uh, did you want to comment on your site visit or? Uh, yeah, a couple, just a couple of quick things, I think. Um, and, and like I think Bruce said, a lot of it was in um, presented in their notes. And then also, um, Bruce, in regard to your question about the, um, actually a lot of questions we had about green space versus parking, um, there was a response from RLA, I think it was section eight, um, that outlined several reasons why it was more cost effective to keep it this way for both the current and future value of the property. So just something to consider um, as we get into those conversations and I'm gonna take a look at that now. Um, a couple of things that really stood out to us, um, I think on the site visit was the, the stream, the proximity to the, the stream, um, dangerous aspects of the stream itself and some of the, the garbage and management around it. So we wanna, um, I think we wanted to hear a little bit more about the uh, renovation to that, which might not have been present um, in some of the detailed notes. Um, the second thing was about trash um, and how one would access trash or, or shield trash. Um, we do realize that the north side of this is actually the back of this building, but it's seen as the front to all of the abutting uh, um, parts of this property or the apartments. We'll see that as the front. So um, any trash would need to be shielded. How is it accessed? And is, is there an easement to get access to things like that? So those are some of the questions that came up um, in regard to how um, both sides of this building would be treated, things like trash and, and paving, grass areas and so on. But I think we have a lot of those answers in our notes. So thank you for those. Um, but um, if anyone else has any comments on the site visit, um, happy to pass it to them. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, Mr. Nelson or anybody else from the applicant, did you have any comments on the, the stream sure. or the trash or the, or the, is there anything you want to say about the parking in this meeting? Yes, I can speak to those items. Um, we'll first start with the parking. Uh, we, we do certainly understand you know, the desire to have more green space um, however, coming from the applicant's viewpoint, uh, the, the parking is existing and if, you know, if they just have to patch it or maybe just mill the top, um, that would be a better option than taking it all out, having to truck it somewhere and then loaming and seeding. But more importantly, um, while all these parking spaces may not be used, the use of this building, a lot of the uh, residents may not have a vehicle uh, so there would be buses or, or vans that would be providing transportation for them. So we think this extra space would be helpful for those vehicles to turn around in the parking lot. And additionally, as um, Tom had, had mentioned, um, you know, it, I guess we, we'd be hesitant to give up spaces that we already have with the idea being that, you know, in the future, if ServiceNet ever decided to sell the building or something, that us having a reduced uh, number of parking spaces would limit um, any future use of the site uh, for businesses or, or, or whatever. And that would, you know, in turn, reduce the value of the property. Um, it would just seem to be backwards if, you know, in the future, this the site is deficient in parking, then a parking addition needs to be constructed, just tentatively thinking uh, down the road. As for the stream, uh, we had a site visit with the Conservation Commission a few weeks ago, and we uh, revised this plan with some very detailed requests that they had. There is a stormwater easement that traverses the property. Uh, it's this dashed line right here. So it's about 20 feet wide, I believe. So in between these two lines is a stormwater easement. There's uh, quite a few large culverts that go through here, and they convey city drainage, or sorry, town drainage, um, through the property and discharge at this concrete head wall right here. There are several large trees that are growing right on top of that head wall and their roots pose a significant hazard if they haven't done so already at um, degrading the structural stability of that head wall. 
So as part of this project, those trees around the head wall will, will be cut flush to grade, keeping the roots um, intact. We're not pulling the stumps in fear that that would dismantle or, or hurt the head wall any more than any damage that may already occurred. There's also some erosive and degrading slopes adjacent to that head wall. Those will be loamed and seeded and then erosion control blanketing installed along with uh, shrub plantings as mitigation for those trees that are being cut. There's also a uh, drain outlet from the building sump pump that discharges, I believe just uphill of this wing wall. And as part of this project, we're gonna be rerouting that with an armored uh, stone riprap flared end. And that would be discharging downstream of the head wall. So there'd be no risk of undermining that head wall in the future. Uh, there is a fence that runs along the back of that parking lot that's proposed to be removed. And then we'd be installing a smaller chain link fence around the head wall of the culvert for safety. And then I believe the third item you guys had just mentioned was the dumpster location. So originally we weren't showing a dumpster location, but obviously under this uh, revised plan, we'll need to add a location with an enclosure, likely a stockade fencing. And we'll site that in an area that um, is conducive to trash trucks being able to maneuver and easily get to that. If I if I may, I don't see a hand raise on my screen. So at some point I'd like to address the dumpster. Well, uh, if Ryan is finished, you can certainly go ahead, Tom. Sure, you go ahead, Tom. Sure. The, uh, it's not shown on the site plan, but at the rear of uh, the north side of the building, there already is a dumpster and dumpster enclosure, and the uh, master deed uh, provides that the owners of this particular building have access to that dumpster through uh, the parking lot that is, again, to the north of this building, and it's uh, written right in the master deed. It's already enclosed. If you had a uh, aerial view, you would be able to see that. Uh, I don't know if you have that available, Brian, but you can actually see that uh, on the uh, property aerial view. So, uh, and then the residents would be, uh, would have access to that dumpster. And it would, from my understanding, and if Connor can comment on this, but my understanding that access would be through the office area. So right where that your arrow is, that's the location of the dumpster. All right. And I, I think uh, that uh, was Mr. Long's uh, question with regard to trash on the property as to how it would be dealt with. All right, uh, I see Tom's got his hand up. So, Tom sure. Miranda, Tom Miranda, you. if you're finished with that with that yes, description, I'll I'll call on Tom Long. Okay, thanks, Doug. Thank you, Tom, for for clarifying. I think um, the confusion that we were having was also, you know, obviously we we need some kind of easement, so that's written into your deed. That's fine. Um, the architectural drawings show no openings on the north side of the building at all. So whether that's egress for um, our second means of egress for office spaces, or whether that is access to the dumpster area, it is not presented in the architectural drawings. So that was, again, just, are they walking all the way around? How are they getting to that? So I think some clarification in the drawings um, would, would help, um, uh, help us better understand. We understand. And we've, we've uh, reached out to, our, uh, to Mr. Nyhart and uh, the architect with regard to uh, providing that information and they will have it available, um, I understand, uh, very soon for us, along with any other uh, potential uh, clarifications you would need on the site plan. Thank you. All right, uh, Bruce. Um, I guess we can keep this up. Uh, my question is a, a quickie about the fence. Uh, um, 
uh, getting names here. Ryan, you uh, mentioned on, on the drawing show a four foot high chain link fence. Maybe we should go to the, uh, the site plan that you had earlier. That will make it easier. Uh, yes, well, actually the lower one will be clearer. Um, uh, be, could you scroll down there? Um, you've got to the note there, proposed four foot chain link fence to be installed along the top of the culvert head wall. And it looks as though it ends at the top of the culvert head wall. Um, but the, uh, the, the uh, but the, the, uh, the fence on the other side, uh, I guess we were concerned as to whether the, whether the fence was going to continue uh, and do more than just protect from the, the, the culvert head wall, because it's still pretty steep as you move uh, along. And, and, uh, and, and this, uh, property line, the diagonal property line, which is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, there's a gate there that is a plywood gate, you say is going to be removed. But the uh, it's, it's uh, the, the site, the current site plan doesn't give any clue to the fact that the property line actually is this diagonal line here. Um, it looks as though it just morphs off into the landscape. Um, uh, so my question, I guess, is how are you uh, terminating at this property line here? Is there any uh, uh, fence here? Because it looks as though there's actually a driveway that continues through the, uh, the parking lot and down uh, along the river to the, uh, I guess it's to the east, let's say to the right-hand side. Uh, is that, uh, is there anybody ha has use? Uh, uh, is there any use that you need to... Uh, uh, service to the driveway that runs um, basically east um, here or, or would you intend to put some fencing or something that defines your property line here and perhaps uh, uh, safeguards from folks wandering down here and, and into the uh, stream area? Sure, right. so. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Yep. So that existing fence and gate is located right here, right off the edge of the parking that connects to the building. Yeah, uh, that, that's going to be removed. Yep. Uh, so any impediment to that bar away, we'll call it, will be removed. I am not sure what the original purpose of that was or what that goes to service. Um, I, I don't believe ServiceNet will require it. It, it is off property. Um, one speculation could be maybe it was re related to access for the stormwater easement to get to that culvert headwall. I'm not sure, okay. um, but there would be no proposed fencing along that property line. Uh, the chain link fence for the headwall would end right where those wing walls of the culvert headwall stop. Okay. Uh, Bruce, are you thinking that it would be beneficial to continue the fence along the some portion of the slope to keep and I think Tom had a similar. I, I think I'll let Tom, because Tom and Andrew spent more time looking at that. Uh, I, I was part of their initial conversation and, and, uh, and then I went off looking at street lamps and other things, but it did seem as though that was a kind of a pretty gnarly space. And it looked like it, it, it looked like it wanted uh, more protection. Uh, and, and, and I suppose that the, the four foot chain link fence around the top of the head wall is certainly a good start. Uh, and the question is, do we have an interest in extending it further? I, I guess we recognize that we don't want to impose uh, undue uh, costs on this uh, applicant, but um, I would be interested in what uh, my colleagues think about whether, the, whether we would have an interest uh, in extending that fence, whether we think we should have an interest in extending that fence or not. Mm -hmm. Tom, where are you on that subject? <laughs> You know, um, it's it's kind of a, a, a steep drop. I mean, I think from the top of that concrete wall to the water, and you could probably clarify, it's got to be five, seven feet, eight feet, maybe down to the water, um, or it felt like that. <laughs> um, it felt really high. And I don't think that the, the, the short slopes on the side of those walls um, are really going to do enough to protect. I mean, I'd like to see those fences, you know, relatively inexpensive, I would hope, 
extending a little bit further along the edge of the water. I don't want to limit access to the water because I think it's great to be able to walk down to it or walk your dog around it. I'm not bothered by that, but it's a really steep drop off um, right around that edge. So um, I would I would recommend um, exploring it in a site visit for safety reasons and not just for the, um, the Conservation Commission reasons and, and maybe propose lengthening the on the south side, maybe to the property line and on the north side, um, maybe a, another four to six feet to capture some of the, the really steep areas. But um, this is a just a thought and a potential recommendation. All right. Um, so, uh, Mr. Nelson, you've you've heard a couple of members uh, interested in looking at that. Is that something you could keep in mind as you prepare for our next meeting? Yes. Yep. I'll talk with the applicant and uh, figure out what what their needs are and how we can come to a solution on that. All right. Um, so. Uh, I know that you are not through the Conservation Commission process yet, so I expect that we're going to be continuing this hearing. Um, in terms of uh, the applicant, you, you received a number of questions from us and you've given us some responses. You've heard a few more comments this evening. Um, are there, do you feel like uh, you've gotten what you might have hoped for or expected out of this uh, conversation tonight? Uh, yes, uh, partially. I guess my question would be to the board, are there any other concerns that we can address um, so that we're, we're fully prepared for the next planning board meeting? Are there any, uh, you guys had mentioned the, the green space um, issue with parking but I, I didn't get a feel a good consensus as to what the opinion was on that. All right. Well, that, that we've got some hands up for maybe not in maybe in response to that, maybe not. Um, uh, Chris, I'm going to call on you first just to give you your input. Well, I think that the board should look at the architectural drawings because that's part of what you'll be reviewing. Yep. If you have questions about those drawings, it would be important to ask those now. And the other thing is we have not yet received a set of architectural drawings that's been stamped and signed by an architect. So that's one of the things that the board normally expects to see. So, you know, it's up to you if you're going to require that. It is part of the requirements of your rules and regulations. So you would need to waive that requirement if you decided that wasn't necessary. But <clears throat> it's something that hasn't been provided yet. Right. So um, you may want to know about what the siding is here and what they're proposing for the roof. And um, you may want to see samples or catalog cuts of that and maybe of the doors and windows as well. So there are issues related to the building. I just wanted to bring that up. All right. <clears throat> um, why don't we call on Bruce and then Tom, and then we'll move on to the architectural drawings. Bruce? Um, Yes. Oh, now it's just gone. Uh, I was just looking at, uh, I took a bunch of photographs and this has to do with the, uh, the site and, and the suggestion made earlier that uh, um, it didn't seem as though uh, this uh, project would need the, uh, the 28 parking. I, I assumed that uh, what Ryan was reporting was that was what the bylaw requirement might have generated, but we uh, um, not uncommonly uh, uh, consent to parking waivers and so forth to reduce parking um, requirements. And uh, I guess one of the things that we were observed when we were there was that it seems as though this uh, pavement was in such bad uh, repair that it, uh, it, it might take uh, more than just a, a repaving. It might really need to be um, dug up and regraded uh, uh, and if that were the case um, and if the, uh, then uh, uh, if it ever turned out that uh, reducing the amount of paving was uh, cost effective uh, to this project I think uh, I would encourage the applicant to uh, uh, imagine uh, that the board would be uh, receptive to uh, 
um, substituting some of that paving for um, for uh, grassland. Uh, it, it seems that there's a lot of people who are living here. There's there's precious little open space uh, that you could sit on, you know, that you could put a picnic table out on, that you could screen in some way to create a, a sunny uh, outdoor space. The units themselves are, are very tight and only have one window in them at one end. So uh, the residents might appreciate being able to get outside on, on some days and uh, over time, perhaps, uh, um, even at their own uh, initiative, perhaps uh, the, the uh, just a minute. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. Everything's gone wrong here. Um, uh, I would uh, in, I would encourage that the the idea of uh, substituting existing parking for uh, grass. Uh, grassy uh, open space uh, be uh, um, uh, be be looked at uh, optimistically and and with the with with an idea that, that that I think the overall site would be the appearance of the site would be greatly improved by having a little bit more uh, grass and a little bit less paving. Uh, even understanding all that what Ryan said about the uh, the uh, the need for larger vehicles to be able to come and and turn and so forth. Um, I, I, um, I recognize uh, all of that, but still hope that there might be an opportunity to uh, cut back on the amount of uh, um, um, paving that we have here. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Tom, you're next. Sure, uh, just a couple of quick things. One, um, in terms of what Ryan was asking for, um, one of the things that came up was this really gnarly guardrail um, and I don't know if you, you can actually see it from the aerial photo and it looks even really gnarly from the aerial photo. Um, but, um, you know, what's going to happen with that, um, is it going to be removed Is some other kind of fencing going to be put in or what's going to, or will you be able to drive through? Um, yeah, you can look at that thing. It, it's not, it's probably supposed to be straight lines. Um, but it's been hit way too many times by too many people. Um, so yeah, I mean, that should be replaced or repaired or some other version of a boundary should be put in there if we're going to have one. Um, so I'd like to sort of see a spec on that. Um, you know, well, I mean, Tom, to interrupt, uh, if, if the applicant were willing to reduce the number of parking spaces, you know, we could have a couple of curbs and some grassy area, maybe yep. even some plantings between those two uh, parking areas and not need the guardrail. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, that's only three or four spots. So, um, so yes, I think mean, in relationship to what Bruce was saying, should we find cheaper solutions that encourage grass or greenery of any sort? Um, I support that. Um, so Ryan, in your explorations, um, let's see what we can figure out from a cost and um, results perspective. The other thing I think, Ryan, that we was in the request and I just wanted to reiterate um, was a, the, a management plan that talks about the hours of operation of the office, what kinds of functions we might expect in those offices. Um, people had talked about 24 hour occupancy of those office spaces and uh, similar types of buildings elsewhere. Um, so I'm just, I think having a sense of who's going to be there and when um, should, you know, and just understanding how the property will be, will operate over a 24 hour period would be really helpful because um, I know the question is going to come up. So I want you to be prepared um, to, to have some answers um, in your discussions with the client. Thank you. All right, Tom. Uh, Karen. Yeah, you asked about consensus. I was also on the site visit and I completely agree with Tom and Bruce. Uh, if costs uh, um, prevent you from looking at that, I do understand that you have budget concerns, but it just cries out for less asphalt and for people that live there transitional or, or just for the town, um, I think it would be so much more attractive if some of that asphalt were somehow um, gotten rid of. 
as far as uh, being um, something that you're going to sell in the future, I think, you know, you can only enhance it by making that area more attractive. It just seems like you're in the middle of a abandoned airport with all this asphalt around. And um, so I agree, please try to have people look at it and see if there's some way um, that wouldn't be too costly that you could make it more attractive and have less of this unnecessary, unsightly asphalt. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, I don't see any more hands. I, I had one question. Uh, what's the what's the mechanical system proposed for these units, and are there any exterior, uh, you know, condensing units or heat pumps or uh, you know other mechanical equipment that we're likely to see on the site? Uh, I'll answer. I'll answer Doug's question first. Uh, so currently. Well, let me back up. Uh, in the comment report, it had mentioned utilities and HVAC systems on the roof. Uh, those aren't present. Those are just vents. Everything is internal. Um, for the, the proposed use for these individual dwelling units, they'd have uh, mini split heat pumps. So they're a dual heat or air conditioning unit for each room. Uh, so there'd be no real changes to the HVAC system. and There'd be no new uh, roof mounted utilities. Well, the, the, the mini splits typically have an exterior unit. Where would that be located for each unit? Um, I'd have to talk with an architect about that. I know there would at least be like a condenser or a vent. Um, so I'll have to review that and what type of vent or shield or uh, facade would hide those. Okay. Uh, and then to answer uh, the other members, they had some feedback. Uh, thank you for that. I believe the guardrail that we were talking about, I think was to demarcate the, the parking allocation under the master deed, this area of parking was specified for unit one. That would be my guess. Um, we'll certainly talk with ServiceNet and see what areas uh, we can compromise with and perhaps do what you had mentioned, uh, providing a green space in between. Um, that would also you know, reduce the pavement uh, area and perhaps not sacrifice um, prime parking real estate for for the building. If, excuse me, if I may. Sure. Attorney Miranda, yes. Uh, one of the concerns that I have, and I don't know the answer to it, but we'll find out, is uh, as you understand, this is each of these three units in this condominium pro uh, project has uh, uh, dedicated open space to their particular unit. And the question going along with what uh, Ryan just said is the location of the guard rail and the cooperation of the owner of unit three uh, with regard to removing it. So we'll have to, uh, we're gonna have to speak with that individual. I don't think it, we would have the prerogative of just going out there and removing or replacing that guardrail without some cooperation or approval from that other unit owner. Okay. All right, why don't we, oh, Bruce. Yes, uh, I guess maybe I'm confused here because the drawing that we're looking at has got a horizontal pink line that goes right through that uh, parking area on the west side uh, that, that ends, uh, that is enclosed by this uh, collapsing and uh, tw twisted guardrail. But uh, whereas the site plan that we looked at earlier shows the, the, the site plan includes that uh, area beyond and above the pink line up to the uh, guardrail. Uh, but uh, Tom Miranda, are you telling us that the head of that Western parking lot is not part of your property or? Uh... No, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to convey that. The pink line I believe is uh, probably from the assessor's map. The, um, the site plan accurately shows the dedicated common area for unit one that is uh, hopefully owned by ServiceNet, but that borders upon uh, unit three, which is to the north. 
And so there is a, um, the location of that guardrail, the purpose of that guardrail, uh, when it was installed, uh, I believe we, we're going to need to communicate with uh, Unit 3 owner and find out um, what their position would be on us removing that guardrail. I, I can further add to that. Um, as Tom said, the assessor shows these lines and they roughly demarcate the, the unit split lines on the master deed. However, this is all technically one property. There aren't separate parcels. Yeah, so it might be useful for you to come back with a, a larger site plan when you return that, that does delineate more of the context for the project and the parking. Uh, Bruce, have we satisfied your question of the moment? You have. All right, thank you. Chris, you're next. You're, you're muted, Chris, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One question that we had is what comprises the property here? And we have old a &R plans and different things in our office that show a lot of these property lines. <clears throat> but we felt that you really needed to show the whole property. And in fact, we did not include 10 Belchertown Road in our legal ad. So I think we may need to actually go back and re-advertise this with 10 Belchertown Road put in because now you're saying that that parking that is to the, I guess it's sort of the Southwest of the building that we're talking about is part of the parking for this project. And you're also saying that the, <clears throat> dumpster and enclosed area on the back is part of this project. And we see that the protrusion towards the west, where the office space is going to be, is part of this project. And all of those things are on 10 Belchertown Road. So I think what we need to see is a whole plan showing the whole property. And then, you know, if you wanted to demarcate it as to which it belongs to units one, two, and three, that's fine but we really need to understand the whole property. And then we also need to understand the issue of um, lot coverage and building coverage. And I think Ryan made a comment in one of his emails to me recently that that was covered in the master deed. So we really need to understand lot coverage and building coverage because um, if you're changing it and if you're making it more lot coverage and it's already non-conforming, then we may need to invoke some other type of permit. So it's it's better to give us more information. Things will go faster if we have more information rather than having to keep asking these questions. Thank you. Well, Chris, the lot coverage was one reason I was asking about the mini splits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had that project down in South Amherst where the mini split pads were part of the lot coverage to make sure we were, you know, within the limits. And uh, so I, I do, I, I, I guess I would sort of add to your comment that this feels like a very minimal application. Um, the drawings are really sort of dense and uh, uh, kind of hard to penetrate. Uh, you know, we don't have any demolition drawings. There was a statement that there's really no changes to the exterior of the building, but but you, know, you have mentioned in your site plan that you've removed one of the entrances. Uh, that entrance, the east entrance has a architectural canopy over it. So you really are altering the building. Um, and so, yeah, I would encourage you to come back with a more robust set of drawings. And uh, so, so why, don't we, why don't we continue and go through the architectural drawings and uh, and talk and see what you've got for that. I have a question, Attorney Miranda, this uh, directed to Chris's comments. The, uh, the assessor's lines do not accurately reflect what is on the survey, uh, recorded survey for the, for the property. It's uh, recorded at plan book 184, page 224 which uh, clearly show that area where the guardrail is to be the boundary of the exclusive 
use for units uh, one and unit three and also include the dumpster. And yes, you don't have that uh, before you, but, uh, unless Brian just brought that up. But uh, so Chris, you indicated that this um, was part of 10 Belcher Town Road, but if this is all part of unit one that we're purchasing, uh, I don't understand why 10 Belcher Town Road would be included uh, as a, a requirement under the notice. Well, it look, may I speak? Yes, sure. yes. Looks like unit three is called 10 Belcher Town Road. And the lines that were on the plan that we looked at previously showed that some of the work is being done in that area, namely that parking area that's to the southwest of the building of unit one, and also whatever is going on in the dumpster area. Those are occurring on the property that is associated with 10 Belcher Town Road. So when we asked for an abutters list, we didn't ask for an abutters list for 10 Belcher Town Road. And these things show up as different um, map and parcel numbers on the assessor's maps. And we need to notify abutters within 300 feet of all the properties that are being affected. So I feel like <clears throat> we're gonna have to go back and republish the legal ad and re-notify the abutters because we didn't have a full picture of all of the properties that were being um, impacted. And I understand what you're saying. You're saying that, well, you know, these properties are, you know, they're they're even though they're shown differently on the assessor's maps, they're shown all together on this map, but that's not how our notifications are are done. They're done based on the assessor's maps. So well, so it appears to me that 10 Belchertown Road is being impacted by this because of part of that unit one parking lot is shown on the north side of that purple line. So <clears throat> I guess isn't some of the problem that from a town perspective, the the addresses correspond to the assessor's plots. Yes, that's right. And, yep. But it sounds like the applicant is saying the addresses are, you know, correspond to the three units. Mm -hmm. And the three unit delineations are not the same as the assessors. I mean, I'd like to see a map that that has both both boundaries on it, um, uh, so that we can really understand it. You know, maybe there's no work being done at the at the at the dumpster, but it looks like it's part of a different address. And this map is something that we haven't seen. Nobody has submitted this map that is being shown now. So we would be um, we would request that you submit this map to us as part of the submittal for the project. <clears throat> if I may, Mr. Marshall. Yes. I don't have a hand to raise. That's why I'm put on my screen. The um, I I understand what uh, what everyone is saying, and uh, the the survey that is shown on the screen was approved by the planning board and it does delineate uh, unit one, including the um, dedicated area exclusive to unit one with the dumpster and the uh, entire parking area within the guardrail. And I, I believe that the, uh, the notice requirement is for, from the property owner, uh, what the property owner owns and the parcel they're working, uh, they're working on, as opposed to um, a neighbor's property that uh, is not part of Unit One. So, uh, what I'm trying to do is to avoid having to do uh, a re-notice and extend this out uh, an extended period of time, primarily because we have an anxious seller that really wants us to to get through this and get this project. Uh, approved as as quickly as we are able and be able to close for them because they've given us multiple extensions. I understand that's not really your um, your real concern, but that's a that's a real concern for ServiceNet. And so we you should have this plan within your 
file for this property. We will get you um, another copy of this plan, uh, a full size copy, and we'll also uh, elaborate on the site plan to, to make this more explicit. But if we can, for purposes of this, of this hearing, uh, if you can accept my representation where the boundary is, and if, and if it proves not to be, then that's the case. When I say where the boundary is, where the legal boundary is, as opposed to the assessor's map, which does not accurately reflect the legal boundary of this particular unit. All right, Chris, I see your hand. What I'm saying is that um, we, I believe, noticed our public hearing based on what the assessor showed as the parcel, which is a kind of triangular shaped parcel. We didn't include the area that is shown within this property line. So we didn't include the entire property and all of the abutters within 300 feet of the property. And in order for us to hold a legal public hearing, we're, according to our town regulations, are required to notify all of the abutters within 300 feet of the property. So I believe now we are looking at the property and I would have to go back to the assessor and say, how did you calculate where the 300 feet, uh, where, where the 300 foot um, property owners are, abutters are, <clears throat> did you calculate it based on the little triangle that includes unit one, or did you calculate it based on this entire parcel that we're looking at right now. It could be that she did the latter and then we would be okay. But if she did the former, I think we need to re-notice this public hearing. I understand what you're saying now. But, uh, and I will, I will have to go back and look. I know that in some, in the back of my mind, someplace it says that uh, it's the determination of the assessors as to who the abutters are that need to be notified. Um, and that is what is acceptable for purposes of 40, chapter 40A, um, even though the, the property may be larger or even smaller than what uh, the assessor's map shows. But I, I understand what you're saying, Chris, and I, I, maybe it's something you and I can talk about after this hearing, and, and, uh, you know, and it may be moot if... Uh, if we did notify everyone within 300 feet, even considering that extended area. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, maybe we should move on to the architecturals. All right. Uh, does anybody from the applicant team want to describe this or should we? Sure. Ask questions. Uh, this is Ryan. So this uh, top view would be looking at the southern side of the building from the parking area. Uh, this is the existing entranceway. It's going to be reconfigured. Uh, what is not shown are the ramps in the handicap walkway. Um, and then the existing entrance to the east that would be removed is somewhere in this region. And then these are the proposed uh, new entryways. 12, 12 units and then one office door here in the center. Uh, will there be a survey as part of the, the final application? I guess I'm curious about how many steps there are up to the doorways and you know whether there'll be handrails on those landings or not. Uh, yes, yeah, so on our, our site plan, uh, let me find it here, where am I? So on our site plan, uh, we are showing railings along those elevation changes of the ramp. Uh, there are railings on the stair access points here and located here. Um, and then these units all on this east wing uh, would have stairs. They're not ADA accessible. And there'll be railings on those stairs? Uh, there sh yes, there should be. I may not have them called out, but that was the intent, yes. Uh -huh. And will we at some point get any glimpse of what kind of material they are? Uh, yep, I believe, let me see here. 
or I mean, is there likely to be an architect involved who can assure us they comply with the mass access board for railings and that kind of thing? Yep, on sheet uh, three, we provided uh, details of the um, curb uh -huh. cuts for the access way and the ramps, uh, as well as a uh, spec for a typical railing and how it would go along the stairs. Okay, uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, I raised my hand in relation to those uh, elevations and plans of the building. So if we can go back to that. Um, the question simply is, uh, uh, do I understand that what you've shown us here, at least as far as the elevations are concerned, are um, elevations as, uh, the, as the existing condition? And so what we need is, along with this, we need a, a, another set of elevations that show uh, and note the proposed scope of work. It, these drawings are proposed. This is the proposed orientation of the building. Well, how do we know what you're doing? We, we can't rely on you uh, uh, saying, well, in here, they're going to change this and over here, we're going to change that, which is what you said a moment ago, that these, these are not uh, drawings that show what's intended. Because- These exactly show what is proposed. And on our site plan, we call out specifically the areas that are going to be demoed and where the access points will be. I think we need to show that on the elevations uh, because we look at those elevations. I've got no idea whether they're new or what's new and what's existing. We, we need to be able to tell without having to go back to the uh, site plan to, to tell what's, uh, what's proposed to be new and, 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 and changed. Uh, you really need to put that on the elevations. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as an architect. I've spent 50 years doing this and, and that is not uh, a set of drawings that shows me what is proposed to be done so far as uh, modifications to an existing building are, are concerned. I think we need to agree that. Okay, we can certainly add that, yes. All right, Chris, uh, you had a hand up? Just minor, I, I want to make sure that they show the railings on the, on the stairs that are going up to all of the individual doors. But when you approve this plan, you're approving the whole thing. So you want all of the details, all of the correct information to be on the plan. So, you know, that would be on the site plan. And I think that what Bruce was talking about here is you want to have clear indication that you're putting new windows in, you know, what, what's the spec on the new windows, you're putting new siding in, what kind of siding, is it wooden siding, is it hardy plank, is it vinyl siding? There aren't, aren't any notes on this plan showing what's being proposed. So it's not a lot of work. It's just like, you know, labeling things. It's not that big a deal. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Tom? Yeah, no, it's just a quick note about the, the front elevation as well. Um, you know, there's stairs noted for the left three units when those are likely going to be, the ramp is going to be in the way of those. Right, so we wouldn't have that. So again, I think this is being accurate with the conditions in relationship to the, the plan that you're proposing. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, forms of egress was something that I brought up before. Um, this is the plan that we were looking at on site and there's no uh, apertures or no way for anybody to get from inside these office spaces out to the dumpster. Um, so if the dumpster is being used from uh, by internal use, um, where the tenants are going through there to bring out their trash. We need to know how they're getting out there and are there stairs? Is it handicap accessible? So, you know, and I, I want to, I think what I want to be most clear about is that I truly support this and I want to streamline this process. This is a wonderful project and I think it's the right thing for this place. Um, I, I think we just need to see the things that you're proposing in order to approve them. So let's just try to get as much information in here as possible so we can move this through as quickly as possible. Because um, again, I strongly support what we're trying to accomplish and what ServiceNet is trying to do here. So um, you know, as much information and accurate as we can get would be fantastic. All right, thanks, Tom. All right, uh, Ryan, why don't we, why don't you scroll down and we can take a look at the, Tom had a couple of comments on the plan. Uh, does anybody else have a comment on the plan or should we move on to the next page? Uh, 
I do not see any hands. Um, all right, why don't we go to the next page? So these are blow ups. This is the. Well, this would be the, the central entrance uh, right here. Here's the porch um, and then the accessible ramp. These would be the three units off to the left at the end of the building. And then the next sheet. <clears throat> um, so these are those three units to the left. This is just a further blow up of that, I think. Well, this is the two central units. Sorry, yes, the two central. The central yep. office with the, the, the adjacent accessible unit. Uh, what's the, for the office entrance, you come in, is that the laundry room with the washing machines to the right as you, so you walk through the laundry room to get into the office? Yes. Uh, All right. Oh, Tom, we can finally see you. Yes, I figured it out. <laughs> so, so that is correct. Those are washing machines and I assume maybe a couple of washers and then a couple of dryers. I don't know how many. Uh, Connor, are you there? I'm here, Tom. Okay. It, can you tell us what's in there in that office area? So the the intent was, like you can see on the drawing, to have both wash uh, washing machines and dryers available for the residents, mm -hmm. um, and really due to the space constraints, uh, it was deemed to put those at that location. Okay. So I see three enclosed offices. And the stairs that are within the office suite, those go downstairs to the basement that is unoccupied, is that right? And so that's purely for service and maintenance. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and then a conference room. So is, uh, do you know, is this a 24 hour office or is it a business hours office? I can speak to that. This is Connor from ServiceNet. Um, it is not going to be a 24 hour office. This is an outreach program. Um, the outreach counselors typically work between the hours of, let's say eight and six. Um, the only necessity to have somebody there after those hours would be if there was an emergency. Okay. All right. Um... I guess we can move on to the next slot, next, next page. All right, and then this is the Eastern part of the complex huh, with all the non-accessible, actually it looks like there's an accessible unit at the left-hand end of this plan. And then the rest of them are not accessible. Yeah, it shows an accessible walk um, that would be along the uh, parking area, but obviously there's stairs up to each of these units that's not shown. So we'll have to update that on this plan also. Okay. Um, based on, I mean, you're doing a lot of work inside this building. I mean, all of the, in, the, all of the interior demising and other walls would be re removed and this is really an intensive uh, renovation of the existing structure. Uh, will you be replacing or, or bringing the insulation of the exterior walls up to code? I'd have to defer to our architect on that. I'd have to, I'm not sure what the current state of the inside of the building is. Okay. All right. All right, are there, I guess that's the last page of the architecturals. Yep. Um, and I, I, I know I had a question earlier about the mechanicals. 
um, I hope we can get a more complete picture of this building when you return so that we can see, understand what you're doing and approve it and let you move on. Bruce. Just looking at this, I, I can see that it's really not possible to uh, uh, exercise, uh, to, to, to create an inferior uh, access uh, to the uh, dumpster area. I guess you could go out your front door and then through the office and into the dumpster. And maybe that's what Tom meant when he said accessing the dumpster area. But um, uh, so, it, it, so if not that dumpster area in the back, then uh, as Ryan said earlier, uh, maybe uh, you'll have to do something out front, but however you solve it, it would be good for us to see either in the drawings here or in the uh, site plan where the uh, waste management is taking place. Yeah, and I will note, I did see Tom uh, nod his head when you described Bruce going through the office to get to the dumpster in the rear. But uh, the, obviously the plans don't really show that avenue yet. Okay. Um, Let's see, are there any public comments? I see no attendees in the public, so won't have any public comments on this. Um, I don't see any more hands from board members. Um, uh, members of the applicant team, uh, do you have any questions about what you've heard from us this evening? Any further questions so that we can clarify before you come back with uh, answers to our questions and responses to some of the comments we've made. I don't have any questions, but the only question I have is when will we be continued and to what date? Okay. Um, Chris, do you wanna, I think you had given me a date earlier uh, in January. Uh, you are muted. January 18. Wow. There's one date on January 4th and then there's the 18th. If we have to re-advertise it though, I don't know if um, January 4th will work. What day is today? Today's the 7th. So going back from the 4th. Yeah, if we, if we wanted to hold it on January 4th, we do have time to re-advertise it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And do we have much on the agenda for the fourth yet? No. All right. And there's no. I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah. Oh, there's no other hearings uh, this month. Well, we have a meeting uh, in two weeks, but I think we've got several things on the agenda for that already. And we wouldn't have time to advertise. Right. If we had I, to. That that I understand. Yeah. Chris, is that agenda looking pretty tight for the 21st? The 21st has Archipelago on it, and I don't know what else Pam would know. Do you know, Pam? Archipelago, Archipelago and Jonathan Gerfein. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if this didn't need to be re-advertised, it could come back on the 21st if they could do that, do all this work in two weeks. Yeah, which... it seems like there's a quite a lot to bring these drawings up to stuff. Um, and we know. would need to receive it by, we like to receive things by the uh, Friday before, well, by the Thursday before the meeting. So that would mean we'd need to receive it by next Friday. I don't see that's, yeah. that doesn't seem reasonable. So the January 4th seems the best compromise. It's sooner than the 18th. It's in time if we need to re-advertise it and it gives the applicant time to bring all this information together and give it to us by, um, we would need to have it by the 29th of December in order to get it into a packet on the 30th of December. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna make, I got two, two comments. One is, um, I think Chris, you mentioned it's it is typical for us to see something <clears throat> about the exterior materials that are proposed for the project, and uh, often we do see 
uh, at least a, an approximation of the colors that are proposed. So uh, we hope you can come back with some of that. Um, and maybe Chris, uh, maybe following this meeting, you could point uh, the applicant group to a previous presentation that we've had mm -hmm. uh, that they maybe they could use as sort of a template for how the kinds of things we usually see. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I guess the other comment I was going to make was, uh, you know, maybe we should just go ahead and and make them have a motion to continue to January fourth at say six thirty five, and um, you know if for some reason they're they're not ready at that point, we can open and then continue the hearing again. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, uh, Mr. Miranda. I see your hand. Thank you. The my understanding is the only change uh, with regard to materials is it will be windows and doors. Is that correct, Connor? Tom, that is correct. So when you're asking for materials, siding, color, et cetera, we don't anticipate any changes. So it, you want to see uh, the windows, the doors that we're going to put in? Is that what we're talking about? Well, I mean, the new door, I mean, I think the exterior of the existing building is white. Uh, you know, are the new doors going to be white or are they going to be red? Um, you're removing the east entry and there's a canopy over that entrance. Are you just going to patch in where you're the new roof roofing where you've removed that canopy uh, so that there's a pat patched new asphalt roof? Uh, in the midst of the whatever age the rest of the roof is, or will you be re-roofing the whole building? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the handrails, you know, are they stainless steel? Are they glass? Are they painted wood? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the new walkways, the accessible sidewalks, are they asphalt or are they concrete? Maybe that's already in the site plan. Okay. Um, so, Thank you. But, but, you know, I mean, it's like, give us a sense of what you're, what, how it's going to be at the end, I guess. Okay. Um, all right. That, that was my question. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I see, Bruce, I see your hand, but I'm going to call on Chris because she put her hand up. I think it would be a good idea to have um, a catalog cut of the windows and a catalog cut of the doors. So you can see what is being proposed. And I think the board isn't going to get too picky about color, but what the thing actually looks like, I think you really want to know. And any fencing that they're going to put in, you want to know what that looks like. So it's really more materials. And you know, maybe you're going to care about colors too, but that's probably lower on your list of priorities than the actual look of the materials themselves. Yeah, at the moment, the exterior elevations that we have are pretty small um, and, and not annotated at all. Um, you know, we typically would see maybe a little more detail on a section of the ele elevation and, uh, you know, indicating what's new and what's existing. Um, you know, it seems like with all those new doors and windows that you're putting in, you may end up thinking you should reside, you know, replace the siding. Um, but maybe, maybe not. Bruce, I see your hand. Go ahead. Oh, Doug, uh, I defer to anyone else because I was simply going to say so moved to that uh, motion <laughs> instructed. Uh -huh. Okay. Which was basically moved to continue to the date, uh, uh, to the date noted. January 4th, about 635, I think we said. Okay. Uh, Tom, is that is when your you're second? The motion. I second that. All right. So board members, we have a motion seconded on the floor. Are there any more comments from the other board members? You guys have been pretty quiet. The, the three of us have talked more than anyone. I have, I have one quick comment though. Sure, Tom. Um, I think, and I know we're not really looking for like really concrete demo plans, but the existing elevation um, over the entry 
has an arch, arched or swooping roof, and your proposal has a flat or um, flat seam across the top of the roof. And I think um, that it's going to require some kind of material change and construction change. Um, so I think seeing some uh, uh, existing elevations might be helpful um, and sort of noting what's being changed. So Agreed. And I think Bruce said something similar earlier too. Okay. So we're, I think the three of us are on at least uh, the same wavelength. Okay, um, no, not seeing any more hands. Why don't we go ahead with the vote to continue to January 4th, uh, 630. Um, so Bruce? 635. Uh, aye. 635, yes, Pam. Still aye. Thank you, Bruce. Tom? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice night. Okay, you too. All right. Time is 9.18. And moving on to the next items on the agenda. We're on to old business, topics not reasonably anticipated. No Chris, old business, anything? no. Anything? No old business that I can think of, unless Pam right. can think of something. Any no. new business not reasonably anticipated? Well, I wanted to tell everybody who hasn't heard that we are losing another planner, our um, lovely dear, Maureen Pollock is moving on to become the planning director up in um, Montague. And so we're really going to miss her. And um, so that's not such good news. It's good news for her, but it's not good for us. But I thought you might want to know. Thanks, Chris. Tom, I see your hand. Thank you. Uh, in regard to new business, one of the things that came up in our discussion on the site uh, visit uh, this week, a few days ago, um, was the nature and expanse of the um, village? Uh, what, what's the actual term, Chris? The um, East Amherst Village. The East yeah, and and expanding um, that zone further down Route Nine or Bel Belchertown Road to include some of the new developments that are there, um, as well as a property that can potentially become. Um, places for uh, food growth and or co-ops and or rest um, uh, shops that would allow for fresh food to be accessed by all of the residents in the area within walking distance. Um, so there was uh, a request that I was told we would have to bring to the board and new business to ask the planning department to explore what the implications are uh, would be to expand the village district further down Route Nine to the south, and where it would what what impact it would have on neighboring zones, um, and what impact it might have um, on that particular zone itself. This is this is farther southeast on Route Nine. Correct. Not not okay. down. Not down east, southeast street. No, no, down Route Nine, um, further down toward because there's further development of residences down there, um, and more density being brought to that area. Um, we we're also talking about um, the potential for that to become a, a very large food desert um, with lots of access to convenience stores, but not very um, healthy food. So. Um, expanding that zone would allow for more property opportunities for access to that kind of uh, and this would be the the village center village center district yep uh the zoning zoning district okay so i don't know if we need to vote on that chris or if we just need to bring it to your attention and have 
over the next <laughs> however long. Um, mm -hmm. I'll spend some time on that. Mm -hmm. Chris, you put your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put my hand up. Um, oh, okay. Yes, we will put that on a future agenda. It's a good, okay. good idea to start, and we'll talk about it among ourselves internally. So thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Bruce, your hand's up. Yes, uh, further to what Tom was saying, uh, it was, uh, Tom, because I don't think you mentioned this, but it was not uh, initiated by a concern for these folks who are moving into this project, but it was also uh, uh, contributed to by the realization that the uh, colonial village is apparently going to expand and, and considerably so, so that the, uh, the amount of residential and folks who are needing uh, you know, approximate shopping and so forth in this area is about to grow considerably. And so what Tom suggested is uh, seemingly uh, uh, some uh, some potential critical concern to folks in the area, we thought. Okay. Um, Chris, uh, well, I'll, never mind. I'll make, I, I'll send you an email afterwards. Um, Okay, is there any, do we have any more new business for the moment? All right. Um, Form A, a and R subdivision? No, not Nothing. tonight. ZBA applications? Not to report tonight, nope. Okay, SBP, SBR, SUB? Not to report tonight. All right, uh, okay. Board and liaison reports. The time is 9.24. Bruce, uh, anything on PVPC? Are you are you yet a member? No, I think Paul Bachelman doesn't like me. Mm -hmm. no. Chris, I see is that there I've anything we can do to shake? To I shake have, last week, I think. No, it was the week before because it was before I got sick. Um, I reminded Dave Zomek of this, and Dave mm -hmm. wrote it on his long list of things to talk to Paul Bachelman about. So I'm hoping that he will talk to him. And I've sent Paul Bachelman at least three emails. Um, it may be worth it if either Doug or um, Bruce himself prompted Paul. Um, well, I, I could send Paul an email. That would be helpful. Yep. Okay. Because Bruce was uh, nominated to this on September 7th. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, any nothing else, Bruce? I assume from you for PVPC. No, uh, I mean, or second hand from Jack or something. That's correct. Uh, I, we've all been forwarded the material that Jack sent, so in some respects, we're being kept in, uh, apprised. But uh, uh, but I'm not formally there yet. Okay. All right, and Andrew is absent to talk about CPAC. Uh, Tom, anything on DRB? Nothing new. We have a meeting on Monday. Okay. Janet's absent, so we won't hear about the solar solar group. Uh, Chris, do you know anything about the solar bylaw working group? Oh, I do, and I, I go to all of their meetings, and um, they had a very good presentation by um, Jonathan Murray of KP Law. And it was in response to questions that they had sent to him about what um, what can and can't be reasonable things to include in a solar zoning bylaw. So he gave a pretty good rendition about that. And um, he had also given a presentation to the Zoning Board of Appeals a couple of weeks before, which I think Doug actually attended. Yes. And that was very helpful. So we're amassing as much information as we can about solar and what is reasonable or not reasonable to include in a bylaw. Okay. Uh, and then Chris, anything on CRC? Yes, let's see the CRC. They've been working on um, the rental registration. They have another meeting coming up, I think this week. I think it's on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, which is tomorrow actually. Um, and they, you, I've already reported to you that they have recommended both the food and drink establishments and the flood zone um, flood zone zoning bylaws. So I think I've reported that to you already. Yep. So I don't All know right. further on CRC. Okay. 
thanks. Um, I don't have anything, report of chair. Anything from you, Chris, report of staff? Yes, I should report to you that the town council was intending to take up both food and drink establishments and the flood mapping zoning uh, amendments this past Monday, but they had so many other things on their agenda that they took those two things and they put them on a new meeting, which they didn't even have on their schedule. And that will be this coming Monday, the 12th, and they will take up those items then. And that would be for their first reading. And then they'll have their second reading on the 19th. So that's that. Okay. All right, does anyone have anything else? I don't, we still have no public attendees. So I don't need to ask for a last chance for public comment. Okay, time is 928 and I think we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks hurting us, everyone. Doug. All right. Mm -hmm. Good night, everybody. Good night. Uh, stop recording. Good night, Pam. Good night, Mr. Marsha. We'll see you soon. Yep. Stop recording.